since its 1995 debut, there have been many awkward and surprising moments. Prior to E3, video game novelties were presented at other trade shows like CES and ECTS, in some dark and obscure spaces within the fair itself, and to get to those, we had most likely to walk past all the porn vendors. That original artwork appeared three years earlier on a cover of Heavy Metal, an American science fiction and fantasy comics magazine that is around since April of 1977. Because of its adult illustrated fantasy content, there was never any type of fuss around its cover's possible visual disturbance. But when that same drawing ended up on an inlay of a ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC, MSX and Commodore 64 video game intended for kids, and with Imagine's quality seal, the negative impact was huge. Nonetheless, it also helped to sell lots of copies. Something had to be done quickly to reduce that negative impact that Game Over's cover made in the United Kingdom, even after a huge poster had been offered to the readers of issue 21 of your Sinclair magazine. That meant that almost every bedroom in UK had a Game Over poster with Princess Gremla in all her glory. Retailers demanded that cassette and disc inlays started being printed with Dynamix logo on top of the offending nipple and, as well in some covers, with a screenshot of the game itself. At the same time, art editor of Crash magazine, Oli Frey, was working over the original Wiz Royo artwork, placing a kind of steel plate, putting an end to the controversy. Kind of. Game Over ended up winning the award for Best Advert and Best Video Game Cover of the Year by readers of Crash Magazine. In October of 1986, Palace Software released this game. 60 days earlier, in August, Metroid was made available in Japan for the Famicom Disk System. In September, and also for the Famicom Disk System, Akumaju Dracula, also known as Castlevania, was as well released in Japan. Despite the similarities of gameplay between these games, at that time it was impossible to the developers of these particular games know about each other. So, it was a complete coincidence. The NES PAL versions of Metroid and Castlevania only arrived in UK a lot later, in January and in December of 88 respectively. So, this side-scrolling game which features staggered open-world progression dependent on item acquisition was unknowingly the very first Metroidvania type of game. For them, at Palace Software, those two Famicom exclusive titles didn't exist. And when you have designers with similar influences from science fiction and comic books, the result can be, as seen, comparable. This 8-bit computer was so easy to program that hundreds of young kids on their own bedrooms dedicated their free time not only playing games but also making them. That's how many classics like Manic Miner came to be. So, all the success of the ZX Spectrum came from the games that these young kids, ranging between 14 and 18 years old, made at home trying to replicate the ones they saw at the arcades and, to get some acknowledgement from this flourishing community, tapes with their games rapid and massively started being duplicated and passed through in schoolyards and even sent by mail across all Europe. 
There were even radio shows that, at a specific time of day, mostly at night, would broadcast computer programs and simple and basic games that the listeners could simply record with a pretty standard tape recorder. It was the case with the Datarama show on Bristol's Radio West that started to transmit computer data by around July of 1983 after its clearance from the Broadcasting Authority. Many others followed all over Europe. Believe it or not, piracy was the main responsible for the massive and enormous success of the ZX Spectrum and these early years were crucial for its establishment as leader of the home computer market in the old continent. The ZX Spectrum game was one of the best selling of all time and was number one for over a year, even staying on the top 5 of the charts from April of 89 till February of 91. And the 128K version of the game is the way to go, cause all levels are loaded at this one time and has awesome music from Jonathan Dunn that revealed so popular that even Ariston used the Game Boy version on its on and on advert. And on. And on. And on. And Ariston. Damn bruh, it's a dirty game. Out the game, I'm so ashamed. The real talk I still love. Real talk, man. Rambo First Blood Part 2 was originally released in Japan under the name Ashura with slightly different looking characters, one bald and the other with a ponytail. Sega saw that they could alter Ashura and adapt it to a Rambo themed game. So they purchased the movie's license, changed a few sprites, added a Rambo tune in the title screen and released it in the United States. For Europe, the game went through another cosmetic transformation and was released under the name Secret Commando, incorporating elements from both Rambo and Ashura and one of the most awful covers ever made for a video game. And it says Secret Command and not Secret Commando. This is so weird. The Game Boy and the Mega Drive Genesis also got a sort of Turrican 2 conversion. The license to publish Turrican 2 on consoles was acquired by Accolade, who had also grabbed the rights to develop a video game based in the movie Universal Soldier, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme and Dolph Lundgren. So what they did was to transform Turrican 2 into something related to that movie. To somewhat be related to the movie, some levels were replaced by a few new others and the bosses were also redesigned and even a huge Dolph Lundgren was included. The piano intro by Tim Wright ended up being adapted without consent or credit by the Norwegian symphonic black metal band Dimo Borgir and featured in their Stormblast album from 1996. Later this same album was re-released without that track. Recently in 2009, a shiptune cover version of the intro music from Turrican 2 was used in Ghostbusters the video game. Don't know if it was credited or not, but it was really awesome to discover it. Microsoft came up with the idea of creating a controller that could revolutionize PC gaming and came up in 1998 with the Sidewinder Freestyle Pro that is the living proof that Microsoft beat Nintendo and Sony at motion controlled games. All the right moves. Any way that you move controls the moves within the game. 
is the Microsoft Sidewinder Freestyle Pro, the revolutionary PC game controller that works with many of today's most popular games. Motion sensors inside actually respond to your body moves. Plus, the Sidewinder Freestyle Pro combines proportional analog and digital responses at the same time. Proportional to give you the precision and control of a joystick. Digital for the speed and accuracy of a gamepad. And that's not all. You also get the Motocross Madness game right inside the box. It's finally here. Motion sensors for natural movement in your favorite games. Move up to Microsoft Sidewinder Freestyle Pro. Sorry, can. <laughs>Lemmings are natural from Alaska and that documentary was filmed in Canada and the images seen in the film of lemmings tumbling down a cliff into the ocean was one more gruesome act of the human race. Disney's filmmakers brought lemmings from their natural habitat and they were the ones that pushed those poor lemmings into the ocean as Canadian producer Brian Valley discovered back in 1983 in his investigation. So, the designers of Lemmings based themselves in that image of the supposed suicidal behavior of the race. And in the game, we see a bunch of Lemmings entering the stage through a trapdoor and begin carelessly marching around without any sense for danger. So, it's up to us to show them the safest route to the end of the level, even if for that we have to sacrifice a few. 